One of the fastest ways to make gains and to get stronger is also one of the fastest ways to hit a plateau. This is failure training, but you have to do it right. There's some things you have to consider when you train to failure, and it's different than some of the other stuff. Let's talk it can't about just be your go-to. Let's That's talk about sure. this. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe the thing that I abused the longest in my training career. Precisely because of what I said when I opened. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the, the the gains come fast, very oh. fast. It doesn't help too that there's a lot of content around the positive things around yes. failure training too. I think that, and there is this misconception that oh the reason why i don't look like chris bumstead is because i don't train as hard as him mm -hmm. you know and so or like ronnie coleman like you have these super physiques that you admire or look up to and you know these hype videos that are made around the way they train and then you see the the research that supports the benefits of training to failure and you just think to yourself like i got to do more mm -hmm. even and i've seen a little bit of great results from the trailer or the failure training i've done therefore more of it and then you get stuck in the trap that i think i was in for a very long time where damn near every exercise of every workout was taken to failure yes yes you know um uh, it, it does produce very. First off, let's define what we're what we're talking about just before we get into the things you need to consider because there's a right way to do it as well. Um, so, train to failure is when you lift weights uh, or you strength train and you do a set until you can't complete another rep with good form. So that means you fail, right? So you're bench pressing and you do you know ten reps, and the tenth rep is the last rep. Like you're not going to be able to perform an eleventh rep. That's going uh, to failure. And it does produce very, very rapid gains in strength and in muscle building. But it also, again, you also plateau very quickly. That all being said, uh, you need there are a, th a few things you need to consider. One of them, th this is the most important, is because the intensity is so high, the volume needs to be way less, way lower. You can't take your normal workout. Let's say you're going to hit your, your your chest today and you're going to do nine or 12 sets in your workout. You can't then be like, oh, cool. I'm going to train to failure because I heard it produces quick gains and then do nine to 12 sets to failure. Mm -hmm. you, all that's going to do is hit, a, you're just not going to progress at all. You're not going to get any of the benefits of training to failure. You're just going to hit the plateau uh, super fast. You're going to hit it right out the gates. So number one is it requires, or you need to do far less volume, typically between one fourth to one third of the volume. Meaning if you do nine sets for chest, maybe two sets uh, to failure is what you need to do. So far, far, far less volume in order to make this work. Because if you do what a lot of people do is they just take their, their normal workout and just start amping up the intensity you're just not going to progress you'll go backwards is what'll happen it's funny it's it's like if you think about a training partner or like your gym buddy or like the only relevance for having like a gym partner back in the day yeah. was to spot you on your failure yes. training yeah. otherwise it's just kind of a pain because you're waiting on somebody else to show up and you know your whole workout's going to be defined based upon you know them uh <clears throat> contributing and helping you kind of push yourself to that level when in fact like the inappropriate way of training you don't even need a spotter yes by the way uh that actually brings us to another point um and there's there's some history to this right so the original <clears throat> or some of the first people to discuss this style of training. And it's been called a lot of different things uh, throughout like bodybuilding history, right? Heavy duty training. Arthur Drones was the first one to kind of come up with this concept. He's the inventor of Nautilus equipment. Mike Menser did it, you know, called it heavy duty. Dorian Yates called it blood and guts. Mm -hmm. uh, DC training uh, was another way. I think that was in the, like the maybe 15, 20 years ago, maybe 10 years ago. Um, but, uh, uh Arthur Jones, when he first talked about this, he said it's better to use machines with this style of training. And I, I, I think I agree with him for a couple of reasons. One, it's safer. Yeah. Uh, failure training is inherently more dangerous for obvious reasons. The intensity is super high. And if your technique is off or you fail in a rep and you have a free weight, um, you're more likely to hurt yourself than on a machine when it's on a track and it's already set. It's not a big deal. You just let go um, and you're totally fine. Um, also free weights cause more damage anyway, you know, going to failure on a, on an overhead press with a barbell 
tends to be more damaging to the body than an overhead press on a machine, right? And you can pick any exercise, compare it machine to free weight. The very same things that make free weights better for most lifting also can make it um, not as beneficial for failure training. So train to failure, machines are actually great for this. It's safer, the, it's on a track, not as damaging because the intensity that's being used for failure training, um, you have to be really uh, judicious with. Um, another factor is are the rep counts. Um, low reps, really low reps, don't work well with this style of training, probably because it's just not enough reps in so few sets to make that big of a difference. Like you're, you're probably better, in, in my experience at least, training people and, and training myself, you're better doing a set or two to failure in the 12 rep range than you are into like the four rep range. Like four reps to failure doesn't really cut it very well with this style, uh, you know, for, for with this style of training. It just doesn't produce the same kind of gains. I also think that my, my definition of failure has evolved since um, I've been lifting. Um, when I started out, like failure was, failure training to me was, I cannot literally move it to where my buddy's going, come on, yeah. you can move yeah. it, come yeah. on, and one more inch. And you. you're going like, <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm saying, to try and get one more inch, and then finally, like, yeah. take it, take it. And yeah. then it's like, that was failure training, where my definition of failure training today is the minute I feel any sort of breakdown in the movement, and I'll still be able to complete the rep. Mm -hmm. So like, even like as I'm, you know, doing, documenting this whole series right now on YouTube, there's times where the viewer is actually watching a set that I would consider failure, but they may not think it is because they don't see me struggle like that. But I can feel my body like, oh, Eve, any one more of these, and I'm gonna do this. You know, I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna cheat it or shimmy the weight up. And so the minute that I I find myself coming out of perfect, what I would consider perfect form, everything from the tempo to perfectly evenly distributing the weight as I move the bar or the dumbbells, that is failure to yeah. me. Like I, I'm, and so that so that's different, right? When you were younger, failure was like failure. You failure was I yeah. can't move. Yes, yeah. like I'm, the the bar isn't moving anymore, which is beyond uh, failure. And also the risk, the injury risk is. Yeah. It's so high when you start and to the do that. And the recruitment pattern that you get from yeah. that. Yeah, like, like you're what not, are you training? Yeah, because at, what we have you to understand is that, behavior. you know, you could have you could have pretty good form. Let's say you'll use bench press as an example for most of the movement, and then you go all the way to that failure, and then you are doing everything in your power to try and move that weight, even though you can't anymore. And it's really difficult. I don't know very many people that don't start to leverage their body. No. To, to get it that extra inch to try and complete that rep. And at the, that point, what are you doing? Yeah. I mean, what are you, are like, you're not getting any better at that, that movement. I mean, you're proving you can get the weight another yeah. six inches. By sacrificing but, form and yes. compensating. Yeah. So just at, at, at what point um, is, is that worth it anymore? And so I, not only did I dramatically reduce the amount of total failure I train ever, but then even my definition of taking it to failure when I do take it to failure looks dramatically different than what it looked, say, 10, 15 years ago. 100%. That's the way it should be used. Um, and the data even shows no additional benefit from going beyond failure, which is like what you're talking about with forced reps or partials or anything like that, except for the rare occasion. Um, uh, you know, And also, by the way, the reason, part of the reason why – there's a few different reasons why we almost never recommend failure – on the podcast. Uh, one of them is the injury risk. Number two, nobody knows how to do it right. Um, and number three, you can never train to failure forever and get great results. <clears throat> yeah. You, okay. So it's a very small window. <clears throat> yes. And <clears throat> when you do this, if you have experience and you're like, Hey, I want to experiment with this. So you cut all your volume down by one, you know, down a third or a fourth of what you were doing before. And you experiment with this, you're going to get exceptional gains for about three to four weeks. Some mm. maybe a little longer and that's it. Mm -hmm. Like you get really, really fast gains in a short period of time and then you plateau super hard and then you're done. And then you go, you got to back way off. And a lot of people can't handle that because of the early fast gains. Like I remember when I first tried this style of training, I remember I was a kid, right? So when I started lifting weights, I was 14 and from 14 to 16, my training was very high volume. It was, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger style bodybuilding type of stuff. And I did that forever. And then I got Mike Menser's book, Heavy Duty, and I did that. And Heavy Duty was so different from what I was doing before. Literally, Heavy Duty was this. I'll, I'll give everybody the, the cheat sheet. It was 
uh, three days a week. Monday was chest, shoulders, triceps. Wednesday was back, biceps. Friday was legs. It was one set to failure per body part. Now, up until that point, I was doing 20 sets per body part. You know, it was just insane. So I did that and I got strong and I gained, I don't remember, eight pounds of muscle in like a real short period of time. Then I plateaued real hard. Now, you show a kid, I mean, let alone a kid, you show anybody those kind of fast gains, they're going to be stubborn with the, no. the program. And I was. I was stubborn with it for like a year. In fact, I thought the the advice that was given by Mike Menser back then was, oh, you're overtraining again. So now back off even more. So then you go from three days a week to two days a week to once a week to once every, you know, six days. Like, and, and it just, I just kept plateauing and getting no results. Then I went back to volume and I got great, got great results. And the data, by the way, supports this. Uh, volume is connected to muscle growth, intensity also, frequency also. Like you have to play with all these. But if you do this and you do it right, you can throw in one or two short periods of time in the year when you're rested and everything feels good, um, where you'll get these just incredible uh, gains. But be careful for the injury. Hey, sorry to interrupt you. Look, are you lifting weights, eating a ton of food, and struggling? You're not packing on any muscle. You're not building any muscle at all. You're not getting stronger. Well, check it out. We have a hard gainer guide. This can be your ultimate resource to turn that around, pack on some muscle mass with our hard gainer guide. It's totally free. You can get it by downloading it, clicking on the link in the description below. Injury risk here is no joke. Like what Adam said, like, especially if you're advanced, let's say you add, let's say you do this um, and you add 30 pounds to your squat, but you're already pretty advanced. 30 more pounds to your squat in a four week period. If your form is off a little bit, you'll probably not feel good. You'll yeah. probably start to feel some pain in some of your joints, injury risk goes high. Muscle tears are <clears throat> much more common with this kind of training. Warming up is very crucial with this style of training. Yeah. Like you need to do like good four sets of warm up and feel totally prepared to go all out. You know, one of the other benefits of this style of training, I'll say, especially for people who are experienced, is it helps you recalibrate your intensity. Mm -hmm. Because what tends to happen with me, especially with certain exercises, is I'll stop two or three reps short of failure. But without realizing it, um, I'll start. It'll be like five or six or seven reps short of failure. But I don't realize it until I go and do to, do a set so you to failure. Stretch yourself just a bit. Yeah, yeah, and then I'll go. Oh, I well, actually had more reps than I. That's thought. why I look at it as a competitive event. It's not like a, a usual thing yeah. that um, I'm incorporating in my training. It, it's more of like I'm building up towards this display of a competitive event because I'm trying to push myself and see where I'm at limitation wise. Um, and, and much like a sport, like I'm preparing all season for now my expression. Oh, great, so great way to say this that. is a, this is an expression of like what you're capable of, but you don't want to stay there because it really is not beneficial for you mm -hmm. and in long term in your body, it's not going to be able to, um, you know, sustain that kind of like excess stress. Speaking no. of sport and great expression, did you see? Saquon Barkley's move yesterday. Yeah, the, bro. I got to show hurdles yes. backwards. Yes, they showed. Doug. I don't even watch. I want Doug, ball, but I saw over Doug to put it on the TV so he could see. Sickest this one. thing I've ever seen. Yeah, probably one of the cool, coolest. Like how crazy is in it? in game live moves. You know, yeah. what just blows me away is just the level of uh, like the, the the varying degree the of proprioception of athleticism that exists athleticism. In, the, in humans is ridiculous. Uh, just, and to yeah. do something like this on on TV, so, real game. I just sent to Doug to. To group thread, so hopefully you can pull it up on the screen so we can watch it because this is a really good clip because they actually do it like in slow mo, so you can see it. Dude, he was so in flow state. Oh I, that God. is just so unbelievably impressive to me to be able to have. Have you? You haven't seen this, Doug? Have you? No, I haven't. Watch, watch this play. Watch what he does. Right. We'll spin move. Oh, that's and crazy. Then <laughs> just crazy. He knows the, the defenders there, and he just jumps and he's backwards. Is he like Spider Man? He's got Spidey sense. This Oh, oh, right. <laughs> I mean, it it almost so looks like it, like intentional, like it was like orchestrated. It's so like pretty and perfectly yeah. timed, like so wild, dude. Know. You know, I was at th this this point also. I mean, thinking about like super athletes, that you made me just think of that. Uh, and I saw this other one that they did this. They did this whole study on uh, Indy 500 or, uh, race car drivers. Yeah, and something to do with like uh, they had this genetic like anomaly with how few times they blink. 
they had this, they just whole thing where they made them all wear glasses and measure the amount of times they blink in a, like a, a lap. And then, then they compare them to the average person. And you or I are probably like the average person and our <laughs> eyes blink X amount of times <laughs> and they just don't blink like a, a dramatic amount of difference, oh which God. equates to like minute, lots of minutes of eyes being aware and open in while they're racing, which makes total sense why they have this yeah. crazy well, champions at staring. Contests. What people need to understand is that at the, the top pinnacle levels of anything, whether it's business or intelligence or sport or whatever, what you have is a combination of extremely rare genetics with obsessive uh, training and practice for years and years and years. So it's literally like you know, it's yeah. it's one in a billion. Their you focus know, is just unreal. That you know, I didn't really understand that till not that long ago. Uh, that that's really what we see today is just an example of enough time has passed by, enough uh, decades of football, enough decades of racing that we've uh, what's it the democratization of that Sports, yeah. has happened so much that that's what you're saying is like that's really like people always like to point to like oh it's steroids in sports or it's oh the newest technology or whatever like that like that has so little to do with it, it so has, little has more to do with people that should be racing yeah. cars have found cars right. people that yeah. should be you know we've swimming siphoned pools. them off early and, and yes. giving them a better you know what uh, yes. in strength sports all you got to do is look at some of the world's best pound for pound power lifters and deadlift or bench press. Just compare those two body types and you'll see very vastly different looking yeah. body types yeah. because of the leverage that's, you know, that's required, uh, you know, to do those. And things. they were, and, and when, and then when you go back and you see, and now we are at time too, where you can go see someone like Saquon Barkley's probably high school footage. Yeah. And you watch him and you're like, Oh, he's probably running circles. on. Yeah. Anybody, you, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, have you ever, I don't know if you've seen any stuff like this before, Sal, but they take some of these guys, especially a, a pro like him, and they show him playing at like his high school. And if he played for some normal, high, it like looks like yeah. men amongst little children, like playing. I yeah. know you guys have told that story uh, so many times when you guys played the 49er Niners. linemen yes. at basketball. Yes. Yeah. And they were just dunking on you us. guys, even though they're a bunch of from half court draining it. Dude, I remember in jujitsu, when I was at my peak, as good as I, as I, as I ever was in jujitsu, I'd been training for six years. I was uh, purple belt. I could hang with black belts, with most black belts. And I was pretty good. And I remember this guy came and I outweighed him by probably 30 pounds, but he was a world, world ranked jujitsu fighter. He was a black belt, but nonetheless, like I said, I could hang with black belts for a while. And he, he tapped me out. Like, I mean, he, I mean, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. He probably could have been eating a sandwich at the same time. <laughs> it was so yeah. humbling when you go from good to world class, yeah. it was like, what is happening here? It's I'll like put my hands wrestler. on him, I tap out. I was yeah. like, what is happening here? That wrestler you always showed me on Instagram that oh, challenges yeah. people to to take him down. Oh yeah. Dude. Well, and it's to your unreal. point, and to your point, it's it's in every class, everything from business to yeah. every sport. Yeah. Like, I mean, I don't know if I share this on the podcast. You guys know this story, but I mean, even when that recent experience where we went in and wrote, uh, raced the exotic cars around the track. It was so funny, so humbling when I told the driver or told the pro driver who's driving around with me like, hey, you know, today um, I really want to get what it feels like to have this car get out from underneath me and I want to be able to try and control it. When I, and he laughed at me. <laughs> He's like, yeah, you, it's not going to slide out from underneath. Yeah. I'm like, okay, you know? Yeah. And then it, what I realized was I'm the limiting factor. I'm so like, no matter how many times I went around that yeah. track, yeah. I'm the, the one that the it. car can do so much more than what I, I'm killed. With. And then to see him drive in an SUV <laughs> teaching us yeah, where the AVA, it was an SUV. And, yeah, an SUV. Looking back and like talking to us. Yeah, as he's he turns like, around and gives corners. Justin a fist bump <laughs> yeah. as the tires are screeching around the corner and we're like sliding around. Have you guys, not you gonna guys, lie, that made me nervous. Wild. You know, what, you know what's the craziest? You guys ever watch uh, like a, a like an inside view of rally car race? Rally car yes, racers? Yes, bro. I How think do that's they know? It, that's what to do. It's so fast. Like, like you're the, to turn and to jump. You have and to have like, that navigator like really focused. I, I mean, I don't care who's navigating. For I think me, that's bro. one. I think that's actually one that's of the most fascinating well. things to actually watch is to and and to hear the commands yeah. like the yeah. way he he's talking. He's got a little notepad and he's talking as super fast. You know what I'm saying? And then the guys just like little commands like that. <laughs> yeah. And you're, and the yeah. trees are just whizzing yeah. by. And there's people on the sidelines watching him not yeah. getting hit. Yeah, they're just Yay. yeah. Dude. yeah. <laughs> that so has crazy. to be one of the wildest. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're just you're you're cut from a different cloth to I mean anybody can do anything right like yeah. I'm uh you know I'm I'm not a volleyball player but I can get out and play a little bit of volleyball but uh, elite elite level yeah 
like you we've now got to a place now where you people figure that out you know, at an early age you know it's funny know. all these like top level athletes like these you know nfl players or rugby players or whatever you know what they were thousands of years ago they warriors. were warriors yeah, yeah. Dude, they were warriors on this the like, hey this is a guy we sent yeah this is a guy well, we go go send we're to go all just the- mimicking yeah. war we're yeah. like oh there's john he's gonna yeah. go kill it's our goliath people. you know yeah. what i'm saying <laughs> <Dude>. <laughs> go, go, go. <laughs> just ride through on a horse and just ch- yeah kill everybody dude yeah speaking of athletes and like sports and like so i had um everett um decided to try out for basketball and he's never played before so oh, like we awesome dude we've like shot you know we've shot around he's played at recess like just little pickup things with his friends and like you know knock out and some yeah. of those regular things but never like an organized ball or anything and so he's like terrified right and so the last like it was like two days leading up to that i was like okay I'm going to help you out. And like, I put my coach hat on and was just like out there with him running drills, running like, um, fundamentals and like really just trying my best. And I'm like, Oh, I was like, I had all this anxiety. Cause I'm like, <laughs> you, this is all like on my shoulders. You had probably you know? more anxiety than he did. Oh my God. I was like, dude, I don't want to set him up for failure. You know, this is going to be brutal. Uh, cause I want him to love it. Yeah. You know, selfishly he's doing jujitsu and he loves it, but he's just kind of like, I don't know. He's, he's not real competitive with it. Uh, but he wants to do this too. And so I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll see if I can help you out. And so we're, we're drilling, we're doing this, we're kind of going down and, um, you know, recruited some neighborhood kids and I was trying to get a little bit of a feel with that. And I'm like, oh, he's got pretty good handles. He kind of sees the court. Like he doesn't know a lot of the rules. I was trying to teach him how to box out and like all these types of things and like pick and rolls. Um, and so we get to the, the actual tryout and we're there and like a lot of his friends, a lot of the neighborhood kids and, um, you know, eighth graders down to, you know, his level. And so, uh, turns out cause his last name's Andrews. He's first, like oh, very, yeah. very first. And, and this is just so to, nerve wracking to be dude, the first kid. And it's just a cone drill where you, you have to like dribble through all these things, show off your moves. You got to do layup. You got to do uh, perimeter shots. Then you got to cross over. You, you do all these other drills. You come back and then you, you shoot a, a three um, and then get your rebound and score and all this stuff. And like the guy's trying to explain it doesn't, doesn't even demonstrate it. So he just sitting there like, what am I doing? You know? Oh no! And me and Courtney are sitting there. Oh my God, he's first. Uh, <laughs> like, how would he do? Gonna, he crushed it. Like oh, he, right. he went through. He like gets his layup. He's he's crossing over. He's shooting a perimeter shot. He made like three shots, and then everybody's clapping for him when he's done. And I literally like had to walk out of the building and was just like, <gasps> oh. <laughs> it was so funny. I was like, why am I so nervous? Uh, I would be too though. Did he that make would, it? That would get me. I mean, we'll find out. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he he did well, but that's yeah. so we'll great. find out. Uh, fifth, sixth. What grade is that? What, fifth, what grade is he in right now? Yeah, he's in sixth. He's in sixth grade yeah. right now. Okay, so that's complete, and, good time to start. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. That, I mean, that's right. Right around when I so I was same thing. I was playing like recess ball at that time, and then I I remember trying out, and I remember trying out for sixth grade, and it was nerve wracking shit. It was a I was going to a big school at that time, and there was a a, a lot of kids, and very similar. We had a similar like. Except for we had to wear these, uh, we had to wear these things that so you couldn't see the ball. There were these goggles you put on, and it, it blocks you from so, you, lo- so to see if you could yeah dribble to see if you could without dribble without your hands. Oh. And you had to put them on, and you started, and you had to do this whole you know dribble forward, you know That's side weird. shuffle, crossover. Huh. Yeah, you had to do all this stuff. It was a like very competitive school. The school that I went to at this time, and uh, man, luckily I was Schaefer, so I was like I could watch other kids do it first for it. But I remember being so nervous. To be, I'm be, to be tested at that point in my life. I had never been tested for a sport yeah. that, and that was my first in, introduction to it. I'm in a new school and it was, but thank God. And I could not imagine if I had to be a first kid and then go do that. That's I, like yeah, I super like aftermath anxiety. I swear. You're talking, talking about, about it. About it. <laughs> it's so Dude, funny. Speaking of competition, I had, so my, my son Aurelius turned four, right? So he had his, his birthday uh, over the weekend and we got him an air hockey table because he nice. really wanted one, right? Yeah. And he's at his age, uh, kids, his age and younger, although he's getting close now, but at his age, it's, it's developmentally appropriate for them to not be able to handle losing. They just don't like, they don't understand that they can, that they can lose. They'll throw a fit, whatever. And it's developmentally appropriate type of deal. Right. So Jessica, she's super into childhood development and she's like, you know, when we play, let them win or whatever. So, you know, do the whole thing. But anyway, we're playing. 
and part of me, I'm dad, right? So part of what we're playing, I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, score some, score some, some goals on him. So we're going, and he gets pissed off. No, that one doesn't count. That one doesn't count. I hit that one. Uh, you're going too fast. You're going too fast. <laughs> and then he gets mad. He puts down the puck. He's like, I'm. He puts his hands on his hips. I'm not playing anymore. You're not. You're too fast. I want you to be slow, like mom. <laughs> <laughs> and she's over here. And she's back there. Uh, like you want me to be slow, you like your mom. Preparing your son. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm dad. I'm a little yeah. faster, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I was keeping it close. I was trying to keep it close. Yeah, yeah. And, hey, you're gonna lose sometimes, buddy. That's not fair. You're cheating. I'm like, no, I'm just fast. That's all. Yeah. You got to move fast. You know? I mean, haven't they, they, there's been there's been plenty of stuff about this, right? Like there's uh th there's um you want um. Obviously, you don't want to just pound the kid. No, right? You don't want to crush him from wanting to. Do yeah, it. you don't want to crush him to where it crushes yeah. his soul. But then you also don't want to just give it to him. No, when they're right? this, now that he's four, yeah, it's now yeah. it's getting to the age where now he ha he's going to learn. Like how that's how, that's even how I wrestle with Max, right? I wrestle with him. Mm -hmm. like, you give him some challenge. Oh yeah, like yeah, I'll yeah. hold him down for a little bit. I don't yeah. just give up. But you're not going to dominate him. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I don't just and I and I also don't just spirit. let him dominate me. It's yeah. like no, I make sure that he has a, a challenge why he does it right. So but yeah, but I don't but. We're, we're not like, uh, it's not like, you know, how they get older and then they don't keep score or they give the kids a trophy. That's not the same thing. Yeah. That's ridiculous. No, right? no, 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 that's, no, that's totally different. Thing. That's totally different. That yeah. I think is teaches kids terrible. Isn't that, uh, okay. Skills. There's been enough uproar about that. Is it not reverse course? Have you guys, I, I mean, you're the one who has kids right now in the, in the, that um, age level. I mean, it feels like it, if I feel like it's it, you get past, I think the, um, I don't know what age range, maybe like eight, I would say, like, you know, kind of coming up. I, I feel like it changes a bit because then, you know, a lot of those types of kids that just, you know, want to be acknowledged or they're just there because their parents dropped them off, you know, they kind of siphon off. Like yeah. they're not going to make it very long in the sports world. So I think that it does. I don't really see it as much, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, you know that they're, 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 I mean, they try to apply this philosophy to a lot of things. Like, uh, we don't, we're, we're going to change the standards cause we don't want kids to get lower than a C or we're going to change the standards for the fitness test. Cause some kids can't do this or can't do that. That's where the grading curve came and from. And it's right? like, you know, uh, life doesn't adjust anything for you. Like yeah. you get in the working yeah. force. I know. It's not like a job's like, Oh, you know, we'll make sure we lower the standards so some people can get hired. They're like, sorry, you're not getting hired. You suck. Like yeah. what do do better? Too late to learn. Hey, that, although you know? I do want to, you know, companies did try to adopt some. I remember when Twenty Four Finish tried to kind of adopt that philosophy, and it crushed them mm -hmm. because what did was, they do? So what they did was, I remember this. It was like it was a, a crucial time when they got so different from when we start. When so I when, started there, it was so different. Oh, of course, it was when you, early on when I was there too. Yeah. It was it was very much Sink so. Swim, if you wanted to be a top dog yeah. because at the top is where you got the biggest bonuses, you got all the awards, you got all the great stuff. But the, what they decided to do, this was when uh, Carl Lieber came in there, and they decided that they would cap the top and they would bring up the pay for the bottom. So they totally rewarded people for being mm -hmm. like middle. So they tried taking, they allocated the extra money that they were awarding the top performers, put a cap on them, took that to bolster. And they even presented it that way to say, hey, you know, like we've got a lot of people who are struggling to get, get by and, and pay their bills and do these things. And so what we want to do is we want to bring up the bottom rung and make everybody kind and of more- failed. Yeah, and it totally failed. Of course it did. It totally failed. And they thought percentage-wise, well, these these top performers only represent like 10%. Mm -hmm. So we're better off, you know, pissing off the 10% and helping up the bottom 80, yeah. thinking that it would elevate the and it, it did the opposite. <laughs> yeah. It, because those front runners played such a huge role in pushing the company forward mm -hmm. and and over uh, outperforming prior year. It's human nature. And then you took all these people who oh, yeah, were the very motivated. Ethic. And what they don't realize is that, yes, of course, there's going to be a percentage of people at the, at the very bottom bottom that oh that helping them out a couple more bucks an hour oh that would help them move from the poverty line or whatever yeah. and so now they could pay their bills but it also took away some of their motivation like it like for the of course you know what's interesting to me is that they make these yeah. arguments they'll extend this argument to like things like uh, the ceo makes this much money and the average employee of this company makes this much money how terrible or whatever and people will a lot of people will be up in arms and say that's not fair but you almost never hear that with a sport, like a professional sport. Like you don't watch a, a game. Yeah, nobody complains about how much, Steph, how much Steph Curry LeBron or Steph Curry gets paid. Why? Because you watch the game and you can see clearly. Oh, yeah. I see. He's way more talented. Right. But yeah. the pro but with business, no people don't watch yeah. the game. Yeah. And so then they see the money and they go, well, that's not fair. Well, they, don't, they don't understand that it takes a certain talent to be able to run a company. Like, well, yeah. that's, like it's an art. That's, that's what it is. What it is.
is is if you watch basketball, especially that religiously where you understand salaries and stuff like that, like you understand the game and you understand why a lot of people watch business from the sideline and it. don't just, know anything yeah, about no, it. And just, then all they see is it's just a, job a big contract for the CEO. And they're like, oh my God, that's crazy. It's just like, yeah, have you ran a company this before? Is how, this, it's not fucking easy. By the easy. way, this is a, another example of how twisted it is. You, you never hear them say something like, Beyonce made this much money and her average backup dancer or whatever makes this much money and nobody's up in arms because everybody knows Beyonce's... Super talented, and although those people She's are great, star. right? Nobody makes that argument, but they do with business, which is insane to me. It's actually quite effective uh, politics, is what it is. It's, uh -huh. it's it's an effective, twisted uh, reality. But the truth is, in a market based society, you know, if, if if you can if you can perform something that's high of value, and you're one of the few people that can do it, you're going to make a lot of money. Yeah, that's just the way it works. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Interesting. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, are you struggling to see results with your butt workouts? Are your glutes not responding? We have a secret to a great butt guide. Now, this gives you strategies, exercises, nutrition tips on how you can develop a great backside. You can download it for free right now by clicking on the link below in the description. Anyway, we are in uh, illness season. So uh, my kids, my we daughter are. had RSV. You guys know what that is? Oh, uh, is that that's not croup. It's a, it's like a, a, a whooping cough. Or? No, it's like a viral. It's almost like a cold. Now she's almost two, so luckily she had like one really bad night, but she was okay. But with mm. real little kids, um, because we had to cancel like the party because we have family members, uh, with little little kids. Yeah. Uh -huh. RSV could be really deadly, but it's just everybody's getting sick around us. Max uh, caught the flu last night too, he, and he got, yeah, you were saying he's throwing up. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Ned has a good, uh, a really good, uh, product called immunity hero with some good herbs in there. Oh, I need to take that. Yeah. Um, astragalus, We've used that before. It's, lemon yeah. balm is in there. Uh, elder flower, which is like elderberry uh -huh. all. It's interesting. If you look at the data on, this is what I love. Well, it's also what's frustrating sometimes about, uh, data based Western medicine is that they'll oftentimes disregard traditional, um, remedies Mm -hmm. uh, like astragalus, herbs, yeah. lemon balm, elderflower, elderberry has been used for a long time for viruses. And they were kind of like, well, we don't have any data. Well, there's a lot of data now showing how powerfully antiviral they are. Very, very antiviral. So taking these during this, this season should reduce uh, the severity of your infection at the very least. You so might I, still get sick, but not get I didn't sick. take that, but I will. One of the, I mean, you've already trained me to be, as soon as like he gets sick, I gave Katrina, like we were on the elderberry, we were on the vitamin C, we were on the glutathione. Yeah. I just stacked those right away. So I can, can I stack that on top yeah, of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, awesome. Oh, yeah. well, then By the way, it. they're so antiviral. So lemon balm and astragalus, uh, really good for the herpes virus. So for people what? who have, yeah, so people who have like cold sores. Yeah, hmm. Using those um, somewhat regularly can reduce. Is it preventative? Uh, preventative at the outbreak. Uh huh. Yeah, I don't think it'll prevent the infection, but help yeah. prevent. No yeah. Wait, combine that with lysine, by the way. Lysine is an amino acid. Right. If you get like cold sores, I admit you you turned me on to that. Yeah. Because yeah, every now and then it's like once a year, you yeah. get like some ugly ass, you know, cold sore. Yeah. Those are by the way, you know how common that virus is. I hate the, that. the herpes virus. It's so annoying. It's it's super. Like, it's like one in three. It no, reminds more. me I had a, a it's more than one in three. Yeah, look it up, Doug. How common is the I thought it was one in three. I'm talking about the the common version, not, um, the, not the general. Well, they both they both <laughs> fall under that, don't they? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they both there's one's type one, one's type two, right? I yeah. Think so. yeah, yeah. One's on the mouth, one's on the on the genitals. Super, super common. Yeah. A lot of people don't even show symptoms and they have it. Yeah, fifty to eighty percent of American adults. Fifty to eighty yeah. percent. Okay. So it's yeah, actually yeah, yeah. yeah, it's probably closer to eighty percent, I think. Yeah, eighty that's that's a ton. Yeah. You know, you're talking about we were talking about money and politics right before that you transition yeah. in the commercial. And uh, there, were, there was something I wanted to bring up. I was talking to you off air a little bit. I didn't say anything to Justin and uh, Doug. Did you guys see, do you guys follow um, Nicole Arbor at all? Oh, yeah. I don't. I'm no. aware of her, but I, okay. I kind of stopped following her. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I'm like She's in and annoying. out. She popped in my feed the other day, and uh, I just thought this was an interesting point that she made. So I don't really follow consistently, um, but I have followed her. So she was. she's in my thing, and she popped up. And uh, because it's election stuff, election time, she was talking about, um, I guess on the on both sides, this was common, I guess, that a, a lot of the money this year went into going after these influencers. So pay them for a post. Yeah, uh, paying them for posts to post to, uh, to say who you're now, voting. Now, aren't you legally supposed to, don't, Just, aren't you required to say that it's a so paid I, for? If they are, they're not policing that. 
So they because this how the hell do they cover that? Yeah, so they're not if they are they're not they're not they're not policing it. Um, and so anyway, she shared I think she shared three different emails of uh, Kamala Harris's team reaching out to her to say she now she has more conservative values. So of course, she didn't take it, and she's just like, yeah, no, I would I wouldn't take the money. She goes, but then she was pointing out that hey, some of your favorite influencers that you all follow, you know, you think that they're voting a certain way, like they're just taking the money and stuff like that, and then she showed the girl from um sunset uh uh sunset whatever the um sell selling sunset which oh, yeah, is the, the uh, real estate agent. yeah the real estate with all the hot chicks or whatever yeah so there's a girl on there that's like really popular her name's Chriselle and she did a post like a cute little post and she's like oh I'm voting for Kamala blah blah, blah and stuff like that and she goes and you go you're so your favorite influencer is just taking the 25 or 50 grand and posting this stuff and she goes, and how I know that is because this chick didn't even change the wording. She goes, here's the email that Kamala well, she sent. Copied and pasted she it. She literally copied and pasted and used that for her oh, caption. That's lazy. Yeah, she goes, so she's she wasn't even take, she didn't even take the wow. extra step of writing her own post about how she's voting with that. She literally took the email that she was showing our thing and then she posted this it. This is I'm just like, our space, dude. It's like wow, it's just our space. Yeah, bro. It's, like, that's yeah. We got we've gotten offers from. I mean, we just got an offer from. Uh, who is it? Doritos. Doritos. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I was going to say, we've seen this they with tried to pay junk us. food companies. I'm, I'm trying to figure it out still. I'm trying yeah. to Sugar <laughs> companies. Doritos coming. tried to pay us for a commercial. Like, how? <laughs> No, how about I mean, that? How's I mean, that it's sound? not like I haven't had some Doritos in the last year. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. But so it would be it's so delicious. counter. It is our integrity. It is, it is. promote it Doritos. Is. I mean, I guess that's I made it's a joke. The crack about snack. It. We got the we got the because they're trying to tell we you know we want to sponsor you guys and we were laughing about it. We have a group text. I'll tell the audience and I was joking, and I'm like the only way we'll be able to do it is if we're if like so honest. Like here's a super unhealthy <laughs> snack yeah. that we like every once in a while to give us diarrhea. I know? mean, I think Justin <laughs> Justin said it best. He's like, I think we could promote cigarettes better than we can promote yeah. Doritos. I'm <laughs> pretty sure. There's an angle there, At least there's the positive of nicotine. We've no, talked about nootropic nicotine. effects. Yeah, yeah, we've talked about the positive things of nicotine. So I'm pretty sure we can push cigarettes better than yeah. we can push when Doritos. When I want to get creative and hyper-focused, and I don't mind, you know, yeah. trading in my help for Although, me, no, I'll, I'll light up a cigarette. All joking aside, all joking aside, I can at least count on one hand Dorito how many fingers. times this year I've had Doritos. Have yeah. you? Did you eat Doritos this year? No, I almost never eat Doritos. Oh, really? You don't no. like? Oh. No, I, lo I love Dorito them. nacho cheese? Come on. No, Dude, it's because it's because they mess up. What about up. you? Well, have, when we go on like, a family you? vacation, that's like the go-to for Courtney and the kids, and then I end up like, like, oh, Doritos, and then okay, you're so like, you've oh definitely, you've definitely this year had they, some I mean, Doritos. Let's be honest. Yeah. Have you had some Doritos this year? I had some Doritos. Honestly, I have no idea. It's been years. Uh, okay, so yeah, you so Doug's maybe healthiest. maybe I've had one or two just like grab oh, off. No, the I thing, definitely but, have more than that. Yeah, it's yeah. definitely one of those things. Isn't it labeled? Katrina gets Doritos normally. I normally get the jalapeno chips. I mean, they're mm -hmm. delicious. But a lot of times, I'll end up delicious. eating some this of her chips. This turned into a commercial. It is a commercial. <laughs> they got their, we we're got not the commercial. Paid, we're not paid by Doritos. We're this not is not an ad. Yeah. My point, oh, is bringing it up. It's like, well, you know, it's not like I don't eat them every now and then. It's not something to promote. Yeah, I've got down on some Doritos. Aren't they the? I mean, I've had some sour patch kids too and i wouldn't promote that oh, yeah no, you know what i'm saying that's, that's good yeah. well, aren't they sometimes the example given as like the perfect uh ultra processed food yes as like they were like like the a, most they, they mastered yeah in terms Everything, of color the feel crunch, the crunch the sound the, 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 the texture the leaves on your your fingers like yes. people it's an experience that they're like they've mastered that they're the ultimate they're the the ultimate express expression of the the processed science food, right? yeah, the science that goes into processed foods because yeah. they've they've checked all the boxes do you right? remember when uh, i don't know if they still yeah, do this crazy. do you remember when taco bell they must have stoners on their staff. Remember when they when they <laughs> they, they decided to make <laughs> oh, the, tacos. They've got another with but the Doritos, the, but the shell was made out. They of got another Doritos. one right now. Yeah. They got another. Look up Taco Bell's latest special. They've always got some stoner idea where yeah. they you know wrap a Mexican pizza in a burrito yeah. with a you know say like there's all like, <laughs> they every time, Jack in the Box. They know their demographics. They very do. Well, I, I think it was was it. I want to credit Jack in the Box as being the first. To really, they were the first to stay open all night long. Yeah. Yeah. Jack in the Box did that. Brilliant, right? Yeah. I mean, you guys are going to be out. Drinking. It was when we were in high school, so I remember. I clearly remember when Jack in the Box started to do that, and then all of a sudden, be, driving home at one or two in the morning and seeing, yeah. you know, the Jack in the Box line like oh, at one yeah. in the morning, like super long. It was a brilliant move. Open that menu up, Doug. Let's look at some of these monstrosities. Yeah, <laughs> they are. Uh, there's like a there's a burrito taco shell looking thing right. Yeah, oh right yeah, there. the Crunch Wraps Supreme looks pretty uh, interesting. Wow. You know what sucks? By the way, is does it, ever, I, does it ever I, look I, like that? Does it really look like that, or is that just? Like, no, have you ever gotten? I don't know. No, never that's a that. studio shot. And no, yeah, it never looks yeah. that perfect. You know what sucks is I loved Taco Bell growing up as a kid, and it would destroy me. Even too. then, oh, when your gut, but was you never pretty. associate it with that. 
Yes. Yeah, I'd just be like pounding all of the uh, uh, burrito and tacos. You know, it, it's. It Did is you guys pretty- ever order like the thirty pack of tacos? Because you know, you just eat a whole bunch of them. You just eat all of them. It's yeah. easy to eat them. Yeah, you know, just down. It's the hatch. Uh, it's interesting how um, how you know you talk about like people that have battle with like addiction and stuff like that, like how addictive that type of food is. You know, it was there was a there the was most a, abused sus- a substance in modern societies. And once you once you kind of open the floodgate with that stuff, it's it's really tough to kick it. If you follow, because you truly crave it, listen, you're like, man, if, I love it. If you use the same standards that they used to uh, label the addictive properties of cigarettes, so we we came out with. A standard, and there's a standard. Literally, there's a criteria, in other words, uh, that they use to explain the addictive properties of cigarettes. If you use that same criteria and apply it to heavily processed foods, they fit the criteria. They are they change the brain. They have uh, there is a withdrawal period when you go off of them. Yeah. They change how you perceive future foods. So if you eat these foods. You'll start to perceive other foods as less exciting, yes, and flavorful, less palatable, less palatable, and you'll ha- you'll actually crave them more. Um, they are, for all intents and purposes, have been engineered to be addictive. And for anybody that debates this, I hate it when people debate this. Like, oh, it's not addictive. Yeah, look around. Like, you don't think a majority of unhealthy, obese people know that they're <laughs> obese and unhealthy, and yet they can't stop themselves. Yeah, it's because they're it's them against billions and billions of dollars of science. Yeah. And you're going to lose. You're going to lose with these kinds of foods. They, they've been designed to do so. I know. Speaking along those lines, I brought up, a, I found a study. A new study was on Science Daily. By the way, for, for anybody who likes reading studies, great, great site, sciencedaily.com. So this was out of the University of Southern out. California. So here's a summary. Uh, I'll, first, I'll read the, uh, the title. Restricting sugar consumption in utero and in early childhood significantly reduces the risk of midlife chronic disease. So here's a summary. Children who experienced sugar restrictions during the first thousand days after conception had yeah. up to 35% <laughs> lower risk of developing type 2 diabetes and as much as 20% less risks of hypertension as adults. So this was uh, this was done out of the... the setup is important. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now there's two. It's, dude, there's, it's, it's wild. I know I've talked about it probably at nausea and probably annoy parents that didn't do this because it is cool to watch uh, five years later the relationship already that my son has with candy. We just yeah. had Halloween, right? Okay, we just had Halloween. My, we let my son go bananas, get as much stuff as he wants with that. Never once did he grab into it. At the very end, when we all came back to the house, he chose a candy. He chose the uh, Welch's fruit snacks as mm. his choice. Then turned around, we took his candy, dumped it back in the bowl, and passed it out to kids for the rest of the night. And he was cool with it. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, so, I mean, just and I didn't tell him that. I didn't. If he would have asked, Dad, I want another one. I would have let him have it. But it, because he doesn't have this weird addictive relationship with candy, because he we didn't give it did to I him. I tell you guys how, yeah. like uh, what my son said the first house he went up to. Did I tell you guys? He goes up and he goes, trick or treat, right? And the lady, this lady answers the door and he's all, it's his first house, right? He's all psyched. She gives him candy and he looks at her and he goes, excuse me, does this have red dye in it? She's like, no, oh, she, no, he didn't. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh. She takes it back. She goes, here's another one. He goes, wait, 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 does this one have dairy or gluten? Jessica and I are like, sorry, ma'am. I'm so sorry. I'm taking my kid away. <laughs> sorry. Oh, my God. <laughs> we're those bro. parents. Oh. It was our neighborhood, too. They're like, oh, hi, neighbor. Oh, my yeah, God. We're, we're those people. <laughs> oh, my God, dude. Oh, that's like, we might- <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. We might have some bean sprouts in the back. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but, you know, okay, so so this study, there's a couple ways to look at it. One is you, you, it's hard to rule out. Uh, healthy lifestyle habits that tend right, to follow. Right, because that, that type of person who cared enough to not do that yeah, probably Yeah, maybe has there's other, other stuff. But right. there's this other side too, which is, you know, when you're, a, as you're growing, a, 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 especially in the first thousand, uh, yeah. the thousand days, right? The brain is so moldable and shapeable that it, it, and so plastic that it molds and shapes itself for based off of his experiences. And once you reach a certain age, there's a plasticity that you you no longer have like this is and I use this example all the time you if a four-year-old learns five different languages very well they will have a perfect accent in all five languages for the rest of their mm-hmm. life you teach a 15 year old five languages even if they're talented they're gonna have an accent 
in every single one of those that isn't their their native language because there's a certain amount of plasticity yeah. in the brain that that goes away. So what does that mean? That means as a child uh, with their experiences, whether it's trauma or food or vitamins or right. whatever, their brain molds and shapes itself based off of those experiences. It's formative in that developmental yep. period. Yes. And it's like, too, you got to factor in also the gut bacteria and that yeah. relationship between the brain yeah. uh, and the influence there. It's yeah. it's pretty powerful. Like, you know, and this is just something we recently started to kind of trace back mm. to that. And it's like, if you're setting them up and getting a, a healthy gut population of bacteria, I, I'm sure that's, you know, going to set them up uh, long term a lot better. It's yeah. wild to me too how strong that connection is and you know th this is me speaking from my own personal experience right like because that was there was absolutely there was no guardrails on mm. us at all as kid i mean we oh, ate yeah. candy our and generation cereal was, bro, we were dessert the was it was every meal yeah, by, yeah, by, dessert. yeah by the way have you heard of this like this argument like why because what, what are we generation x i think we mm -hmm. are right i guess so. uh yeah. where they say we're the last like tough generation there was this woman that listed all these things i saw this post and she's like they left us alone we could do whatever we want parents yeah. left yeah and like if like we survived that like <laughs> you know yeah it's true but we were allowed to do the latchkey kids the, the yeah. part though that i, I that i'm getting to that i i and i always find like it's i become more and more aware every single time i do this right so been on this like what is it uh, a little over two months now or i think i'm approaching two months of like really diligently tracking and paying attention to everything yeah. And so I've completely cut out all, you know, ice cream, sweets, and none of that stuff is it. I'm eating you know, like ninety-five percent of the diet is whole foods, you know, mm -hmm. with the occasional protein shake or bar or things like that every now and then, right? So and I have no craving right now whatsoever. Because you've for, cut everything out. Because I've cut it out. But I know because I've done this so many times that if I let it creep back in, it, it gets it gets the more a, you eat, the more you want. Even somebody yeah. who is wildly aware and knows and gets all of it, like it still will, it, it grabs a, like an addiction to a drug. Like you just, it, it's almost like you have to admit that first that it's got a hold of you like that and that you you play these games of justifying, well, it fits my macros, I can let you it You know in. what's interesting too though is that the foods now, processed foods now are more processed than when we were kids. They are, even yeah. though they have the same brands. They kept refining the process. They've add, they've yeah. they've added and changed the uh, the formulas to make them even more processed mm -hmm. with more artificial dyes and flavorings and chemicals to refine the experience to the point where, you know, if you if you ate uh, Captain Crunch cereal in the '90s, it's not the same Captain Crunch. Yeah. that they eat today it's still, not still the same. tore up the roof of your mouth yeah it'll still mess up the roof of your mouth that That's shit true. is powerful you know okay so uh, uh, side note or or we'll take a left here i just learned about a, something that's been used for a long time that people have used for their skin for a long time that actually has data supporting it did you guys know that do you guys know what a derma roller is do you guys know what that is is that a little spiky yeah yeah, yeah my my I remember roll. my my they work I, the data I, shows I that they work because it's because yeah. it stimulates. What was it like stem cell uh, production? It's or? damage. Yeah, it's damage. You're literally like damaging your skin. It, right? yeah. yeah, and it boosts collagen production. The collagen production. And right, so yeah. there's studies on derma rollers and like wrinkles. They're and, used to have promote re promote hair growth too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I so remember you can my, roll I, it on your head. Yeah. When I was first getting <laughs> when I was first thinning, I remember my hairstylist well, you know. is like, "You should get one of those derma rollers and roll." And I'm like, "What?" Courtney has one. I thought that was just funny. It just reminded me of like you know when you get that. Play-Doh set, you know, and you have these like little, there was like, <laughs> <laughs> it does look like, like what are you doing? You it know, does, like, it does look like, it's like playtime in there. Yeah. So if you combine it, so here's what I was going to say. Uh, so our partners at Intera, so they use peptide based uh, skincare products. So these are skincare products with pro growth factor or growth peptides. Like they literally accelerate or promote the, the, you know, more collagen production. Like these are like, you don't, you don't find this anywhere. You don't just find this anywhere. These are like, legit peptides that, that do some pretty incredible things. They said, combine it with a derma roller. Oh, wow. So you would do the derma roll first and then probably put it on. Because you cause right? a little bit of damage, put that on, and you'll 
you'll get the the effects times right. you know whatever as it's five. healing and well, I imagine too it, it kind of opens up the pores and so then it get, gets in yes. to you too yeah yeah I mean, yes yes yeah, yes yes sense. so they oh, have the, the, the I have to ask Katrina has been consistently using that I'm gonna have to ask her if she's oh bro the, it's it's the yeah. derma roller oh yeah my wife my wife is like if we run out she's like get me it yeah, yeah. combos yeah, yeah, yeah it makes she's, a huge she's difference. been on top of it like crazy but I don't think she's done the derma roller yet has Jessica yeah. done the derma roller has she tried that no but I'm using it so I use their folatin on my head right because I started about maybe two years ago, three years ago, my hair started thinning or whatever. So I've been using it. And, uh, I mean, I've stopped, I put the track, you know, the, I've stopped it in its tracks. Yeah. Co Courtney ran out and was using that consistently and then actually decided that she was going to make her own like mask and, and made it out of like pumpkin and like some other stuff. I guess there's some, some kind of quality to pumpkin that they use a lot in these products, uh, for that. So, but it was just funny because you smear it all over her face. Comes back. It looks like she had peanut butter all over her face. I'm like, <laughs> what the hell is happening? And then Everett wanted to do it too. So he wore one and he's like, it's burning. Yeah. I, saw, I saw this prank that this, uh, this, this boy, this guy was playing on his girlfriend where they put masks on. And apparently he did it so that when you pull the mask off, it leaves – it looks like you're like you ripped off some of your skin. Yeah. Okay. But it didn't, right? Mm. So they put the mask on and they're looking in the mirror and they're recording it. And he's like, I'll be the first one to take one off. And he oh. pulls it off and it looks like he ripped his skin off. And he's like, Oh my God. And then his girlfriend, because she had a big <laughs> she, <laughs> she lost her shit. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> ah! Ah! I'm like, Oh, that's so genius, yeah, dude. A, uh, some of these pranks are so good. Yeah, I was like, uh, I forgot to mention though, like he put that on because he still had like paint on his face for like a couple of days. From like, what? Uh, yeah, did I tell you guys he, well get my paint he won? Oh, he I won the costume contest, like for homemade contests. Uh, for he come up with that all by himself. Oh, the the whole concept that was brilliant. He looked like a a, a green a toy army. soldier, like a like a plastic soldier. So good and. Uh, it's, so he's out there, you know, and we bought him supplies and whatnot, but he did it all himself and he spray painted. Did you know what he was doing ahead of time or did, did he, he surprised you guys? Did you know? I mean, he kind of mentioned it in passing and we're like, oh, that's interesting. And then he was like, we got to do this. And he took, you know, some of Ethan's old like airsoft kind of camo gear and then spray painted it. Yeah. So he had his whole thing like set up, but it was so funny because like he spray painted all these, like, like his pants, like everything. He smelled so like pungent in yeah. terms of like chemicals. And yeah. I was like, dude, this but can't be good. This is not good. Yeah. It's like, I, was, <laughs> I didn't give yeah, him like bro, he won some the long term. He won like, the costume contest, bro. I mean, <laughs> Worth all it. for the, all Worth for it. the win. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I guess you chalk it up as that, but I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I, hope, I hope he's going to be all right. Yeah. My, my, my son got a little, you sat in the back of a truck with gas fumes for like a whole summer, bro. This he'll is be, true. Yeah. He'll be long okay. He just summer. lost probably a thousand, you know, brain cells, but Hey, it's fine. I was telling my daughter that she's like the other day, she's like, Hey, is it, is it legal to sit in the back of a truck while I was driving? I'm like, not anymore. But when I was a kid, but I'll tell you what. Yeah, yeah. I had a friend that fell out the back because his dad hit a bump. <laughs> <laughs> he survived. Hit a bump. Ah, he was fine. Oh, but shit. I know. Oh, I know. I, my son got a, speaking of like fumes and stuff, he got a camera for his birthday that takes pictures and then it prints out right away. It prints out the picture, but it's like receipt paper. Uh, so yeah. as soon as it starts printing out, I, I look at my wife and I'm like, that's xenoestrogen. Just a xenoestrogen <laughs> cesspool. Yeah, so we're like, Dude, you gotta be careful. Look what you guys are doing to this kid. He's so already. I know. No, I don't tell. <laughs> it's, it's, I don't tell. Red I lied. dye. Yeah, I did. The, I did the better thing. I Gluten. lied. Yeah. Oh, yeah. we ran out of paper. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Yeah. You can't get. You what can't was I? I meant to bring that up the other day about. I, I had a situation. I'm. I'm, I'm going to draw a blank. I'll, it'll come to me eventually, and I'll bring it up again. But I was wanting to bring on the show to you guys because I was like. There was something I did and it was a total, I, I lied. It was a white lie. But then I was like, I remember like after the fact, like, you know, but would I have told the truth there? Like, no, the lie was the smarter move. Mm. Like there's times when raising a child where yeah. the white yeah. lie yeah. is the, is the, is the right, it is the right answer. Makes right. Sense sometimes and I wish I remember what it was so I could give the example to the, the audience. The truth is in the lesson. Yeah. Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, well, just sometimes there's like, okay, that was like telling him the truth in that situation would be, would cause him to go down a rabbit hole and cause more yeah. traumatic conversation than it'd just be like, oh, this is what's going on. Right. Mm -hmm. I wish I remember what it was, but I, it came up and then I was like, you know what? I got to ask the guys, like if they recall a situation and you just did it, that's why it reminded me of like, 
where uh, it's probably smarter just for me to kind of like tell him like, oh, we can't use that paper or yeah, whatever. Give him the surface answer. Yeah, yeah, versus like going into real detail because I don't want to create this like, now he's going to be freaked out every time he sees paper everywhere, right? Yeah. His teachers <laughs> like, this has xenoestrogens? I can't use it, you know? Like, Does this uh, have red dye? I can't yeah. touch it. Yeah. Yeah. Hilarious. Yeah. All right, funny. shout out. Do your, uh, your yeah. you just shout it out. Your, um, your, science, your science Daily. Oh, Science Daily. Yeah, yeah. great place. Is it's it a, a, a Facebook or is it? No, it? no, you just go sciencedaily.com. People, uh, people often ask where I get my studies. That's one place, and it, there's headlines, so they they'll they'll post studies constantly as they make uh, as they make their rounds, and um, you can read the study, and then you can find the study if you want to look at the methods and uh, you know the, the sample size. Really, really cool website. Children's multivitamins are typically just candy. There's a lot of sugar, not enough nutrients. Well, there's a company that is dedicated to making multivitamins for children. No crazy sweeteners, no sugar, naturally flavored, and it has the nutrients your child needs to thrive. It's called Haya. Haya Health is great for your kids. This is the only multivitamin company for kids that we support. Go check them out. Go to HayaHealth.com. That's H-I-Y-A Health.com forward slash mind pump. And on that link, you'll get 50% off your first order. All right, back to the show. Our first caller is Julie from Michigan. Julie, what's happening? Hi, Julie. How you doing, Julie? Hi there. Thanks for having me on. You got um, it. Right. I, I appreciate all the content you put out. I've learned a ton. Um, and I just I will read what I sent in, even though a little bit has changed. Um, I just finished, actually, my second round of anabolic. And I was wondering about the number of shrugs. Um, I, I noticed the first time through and then this time through, I'm getting a knot and a pain in my, uh, I guess it would be my mid trap, not my upper trap. I think I wrote upper trap. And it kind of was never there before. And it just goes away once I stop doing the large amount of shrugs that we have in that program so i don't know if it's a really if it's a form issue i do have a little bit of rounded shoulders so i really try to keep retraction when i do them so i'm really cognizant of that but it still always comes about when i do the shrugs so i don't know if i'm using a little too much weight or if there could be something else going on. <clears throat> it's the technique. Mm -hmm. um, so the reason why there's uh, five sets of shrugs um, in anabolic is the, the, the program is a very basic strength and muscle building program. And we're trying to strengthen the shoulder girdle, especially to support things like the heavy presses, overhead presses, and, and the deadlifts. Now, if you've been working out for a while, you could reduce some of the sets. It's not necessary after you've been doing it for a little while. Um, but I do know how important it is for people to strengthen their, the shoulder girdle, especially as they get the strength gains that maps anabolic tends to produce. So what people tend to do when they, they follow a program like maps anabolic, especially with their deadlifts, their, their, their strength goes up through the roof. And I wanted them to have a strong shoulder girdle. Now, that being said, if you get a knot in your mid back, it's a, it's a technique issue and it, it might have to do with the way you're shrugging, but it probably has more to do with the way you're holding your head and aligning your, your cervical spine as you're doing the shrugs. So a lot of people do when they shrug is they tend to either bring their chin up and their head back as they shrug, or you'll see people dip down. What you want to do is you want to give yourself a double chin and keep your head real tall and look straight ahead as you shrug. You want your spine lined up as you bring the, the shoulder blades up. Otherwise, what happens is you can start to create some impingement in the cervical spine, especially if you have any type of a, you know, slight herniated disc or any kind of disc issue, which most of us have, um, then you'll start to cause problems. And the way that it manifests is a knot somewhere. Uh, and the reason why you feel the knot is the central nervous system is trying to limit movement in that area to create stability because there's a potential injury uh, about to happen. Julie, do you have our MAPS Prime program by chance? I do. Okay. So yes. Are you, um, are you priming? <clears throat> I, so I'm a Pilates instructor and when I got it, I was kind of thinking for my husband and myself, we both do your, have done your anabolic together. And as I was going through it, the, my range of motion and everything in the zone one and two are really pretty good for myself. It's that zone three. I had a lot of back problems, um, lower back problems. So, and then I looked at all of the exercise. I'm like, man, 
this is everything we do in Pilates. So uh, I kind of gave up on that. And I noticed in the last two, last two uh, podcasts that you had, you guys talked a little bit about Pilates. And uh, I kind of like kind of laugh because everything in there, in a lot of those motions in your prime are things we do on the Pilates reformer. So I kind of do those a couple times a week already in some form. Yeah. yeah, I was asking more for the zone one for sure because of the traps. That's yeah. what <clears throat> I would be wanting if, to see you do is to do the zone one and the things that I would be looking at is how well you tuck your chin and keep that nodule back against the wall while you also can drive the wrist and the elbows back. If you can do that clearly with good form and no problem, then maybe it isn't uh, the shoulder rolled forward. But my guess would be priming that before you go into shrugs would yeah. probably help. Yeah, it, you know, we could do a quick test here, Julie. I mean, it won't be perfect because we're on camera, but I could try something with you just so, to take a look at how your neck is lining up, if you don't mind. Okay. Okay. So what I need to do is see a side view of you, and if you could stand, that would be better. Seated is okay, but stand. we could try seated too, but standing would be a little bit better. <clears throat> okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to put your arms down at your sides and supinate your hands. So you're going to put your arms straight down and then turn your palms so that they're super... Yeah, but oh, straight arms, you okay? Straight arm it. Straight arm all the way down. Now what I want you to do is I want you to give yourself a double chin. Depress those shoulders down a bit in order to... Okay, now... Okay, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, so let's try that. Okay, now depress the shoulders. Give yourself a, a double chin. Now let's let's flatten your low back at the same time. We bring this head back again. I'm going to want you to do zone one and really focus on, yeah, no. Yeah, the, I want the you nodule to, of your head. Yeah, basically. I want you to really focus on zone one and prime and make sure that your your shoulder blades, your low back, and the nodule in your head are, are in touch. contact. And then I want you to really create tension there because what's happening is as you're getting that position, you're going anterior tilt with your spine. Yeah. Uh, and you know, and like when you said, when you opened, you have some forward shoulder. So it's not so much like I can do this. It's can I do this while maintaining other other things because there's some compensation going. It's not bad, but that's oftentimes where it comes from. Whenever I hear someone have an issue with their, you know, kind of mid trap and it feels like a knot, it typically is coming from the alignment uh, in the cervical spine. Yeah, and you don't have to, in the zone one, you have your arms like externally rotated to press into the wall. You can actually keep them down. Uh, and work on that, you know, exclusively for now, uh, just to get to reiterate what Sal's talking about and really work on the nodule uh, contact while not like flaring those ribs up. Yeah, the red flag there, Julie, was how you jerk yourself back into position, try to get jerk yourself into position. So you're trying to get in position, you're, you're, you're doing this. And what that tells me, there's a little bit of lack of connection there. Um, and so it's, I would, it would be something you would want to work on. But technique is so imperative that even a, you know a, a small deviation in technique is going to make the movement um, not effective anymore. A another exercise that would be good for you is a prone cobra. <laughs> I would really like a prone cobra would probably really be good for for someone like you. But again, maintaining that that real tall. It's like you're trying to make the the top of your head or kind of the back top of your head as tall as possible while doing a prone cobra. Um, that should help. Uh, with some of the stuff that you're noticing. But in the mm -hmm. meantime, you could definitely reduce the the volume of your shrugs. Yep. Okay. Is there any idea on like a, a, a weight that would be good for someone my size or it just depends on how I feel? It's, yeah. It's less than with the weight. Yeah. It's, <clears throat> it's gonna, about connection right now. Totally. It's going to be all about connection oh. and you don't have to go heavy on shrugs at all. And, and look, if, how many times have you run through that program? Just twice. You could even skip the shrugs for now and really focus on what I'm, you know, what I kind of mentioned, and try to correct that, and then maybe introduce them a little later with really lightweight. And you're not mm -hmm. even trying to go intense; you're like moderate at, at best. Yeah, or even like replace them with uh, farmer carries or something where you're really reinforcing that posture. Right. Uh, that would help. Yeah, we do those a lot as well, and we do tons of cobra in Pilates, uh, all all kinds of, of the movements that you have in prime. So yeah, great. Yeah, that's good. Good, but and when you do it, I the want you to the intent is so important. The intent is really important. You know, um, yes, really create that length in the spine and and slow down and just connect. You know what's what's challenging about this, Julie, is it, sometimes it's harder to work with. Uh, people who have been practicing movements for so long or have a certain level of fitness 
because your recruitment patterns are so set and the deviations in your form are, are hard to see in comparison to somebody who doesn't do that stuff. Like somebody who doesn't do that stuff is really easy to see deviations. Someone like you, um, like if I was in there, if I was there working with you in person, it would be like a half an inch here, an inch there, a centimeter here, and then it would make the big difference. But it's really about creating that, that, that traction through the spine as you depress the scapula, as you maintain uh, kind of a neutral spine in the lumbar area. And you, you want them very retracted as well, right? I do, but you notice how you, when you're retracting them, how they shrug? Your head and your head came yeah, forward just, just now? Yeah, we're just conscious a little yeah. bit of compensation. With you me. want to be able to bring them back and down, yeah. not back and up, back yeah. and down and while then, maintaining yeah. tall, <clears throat> tall cervical spine. Do you ever do scapular circles? Yes, all okay. the time. Okay. okay. I'm assuming you're really flexible. Yeah, I think it's more about the tension. Yeah, we do. Yeah, with the reformer, we do tons of stretching. Yeah. So lots of flexibility uh, without the without certain types of stability can cause, uh, uh, sorry, without certain types of connection can cause instability. <laughs> so what I would see with uh, Pilates instructors sometimes, more often with yoga instructors, would be these kind of injuries, these nagging injuries, and it was really because their range of motion was so good, yeah. but there were areas where they, where they would lose connection. Um, and that would cause instability. So like, like if I did strength training with you, my movements would be twice as slow. I would have you slow everything down. Slow and, and more isometric tension yep. focus. I would create yeah. tension at the top, create tension at the bottom, and just really, really, uh, especially if you're complaining about that mid-trap, you know, kind of tightness, I would really focus on lengthening the spine through most of the movements. Okay. Awesome. Got yeah. it. Thank you. All right, Julie. Thank you, Julie. Great. Thanks. Appreciate it. It's always uh, difficult when you have somebody who has uh, fallen in love with the modality so much that, like, you could tell that when she opened up Prime, she looked at a bunch of movements and said, "Oh, I already do all these, yeah. so I don't need to do this. I already do them in my class." So what? And here's the here's the this the, this is important matters exactly. This is important to communicate to the the average listener because I'm she I'm sure she's not the only one that has thought this way too. Is there's a big difference between doing yoga and Pilates and then doing priming in order to correct something, yeah. and the intent. Uh, so you can't look at, oh, look, I do prone cobras. Well, if you do prone cobras and you have bad movement patterns, you still got bad movement You're reinforcing patterns. reinforcing bad patterns. If you do prone cobras, uh, so so in anybody who's been watching the series that I'm doing right now, I've been doing prone cobras. And if you watch when I do prone cobras, I'm struggling. I'm yeah. struggling because I can. I know that I'm, yeah. I've got an issue going on, and I know I'm trying to work it out and fix it in that. I'm not just going through the movements. I mean, I could do prone cobras, mm -hmm. and the average person would watch and be like, oh, those are pretty prone cobras. But you're tweaking every little That's portion right. of that. That's right. I'm yeah. thinking about my head that's wanting to protrude forward. I'm thinking about that left shoulder that I have the injury because the pec injury and it needs to get more rotated like and i'm holding that in that isometric hold trying to correct that i'm not just going through the movements and this is the problem with class type settings or people that take this stuff is they go oh well i do those movements mm -hmm. yeah but if you're getting issues where you have chronic pain or you're getting tightness in a trap like this that means you're not moving Look, it's not the weight it's not shrugs any people could do 50 shrugs in a workout and not have that problem the knot is because there's there's a, a problem with the movement and the it isn't because you're not doing the right exercises it's because you might be doing the right exercises you're just not, doing them wrong they're doing the wrong way yeah. look you if you take a, a golf instructor and you ask him who's harder to, to teach uh how to do a proper swing somebody who's never swung a golf club right. or somebody who's been swinging a golf club wrong same thing yep. for five years the person swinging it wrong for five years is gonna be harder to teach because they've got some ingrained uh, patterns. And so this is what what tends to happen uh, with people like this. And then, you know, the whole like, because we get this too from people, oh, oh I see the work exercise of MAPS Anabolic. I've done all those. Look, I could give you two completely different uh, dishes. Both of them contain four of the same ingredients. It ain't the same dish. Just because they both have butter and they both have milk and they both have olive oil doesn't mean that they're exactly the same. It's not even the same. It's how you cook it. And some of the other things that are in there uh, that create the dish. So it's not just the exercise. It's it's how you perform them. It's the tempo. It's the intent. It's the order. It's how they're laid out throughout the week. There's so many things that go into workout programming. The exercises is literally one factor. But again, you could hear it in her. Look, I've trained lots of you know, quote unquote fitness fanatics 
who were spin instructors, yoga instructors, uh, you know, Pilates, and they come with the same attitude. Oh, I, I oh yeah, I do all those things. Yep. And then two weeks later, they're like, oh, this is very different. A different experience. This is completely yeah. different than I thought, and it and it starts to work. And again, I could see it when I had, that's why I had her do it. Cause I could tell she was a little smug, like, oh, I know I do all these. All right, let me see you go sideways and try this. Yeah. And she's jerking herself in a position. No, you don't have, yeah. you don't own the movement. You don't have the control. You don't pass zone one. Yeah. Uh, I, I, so I knew that right away. I was yeah. like, I'm concerned about zone one, not your lower body right now. We can get to that later. Cause if you're telling me you're shrugging and you have that knot, I don't even need to see that's zone right. one. I know that you would fail. And I know that I would need to work on something because that's it. That's exactly what tells me that. The fact that it, it's not a matter of weight or the amount of reps that you're doing of shrugs. If one side is getting this knot there, there's a movement pattern. That's right. There's an issue. That's right. And I, you're so not I, supposed to get pain. So I don't even need to see her do zone one to prove my point. I already know it. But if I was training her as a, it was like, we're going to start every workout with zone one. And I'm going to be very detailed on mm -hmm. where I want the nodule overhead, where I want her scapula, what I want her focusing on holding and cre creating yep. an isometric contraction. That's right. And really intensifying that before she goes into these workouts. And then when you go apply five sets, 20 sets, hundred pounds, doesn't matter the weight and reps of, of the traps, they should, they should feel equally sore in the same areas and not these weird knots that are happening. Our next caller is Christina from Canada. Hi, Christina. Hi guys. I was on your show three months ago, asking about the carnivore diet and doing a bigger show. Oh yeah. So I remember I you. Yes. Uh, my focus is no longer trying to look a certain way. I just want to get as strong as I can, like a beast. Uh, right. So what's my question? Um, I was a competitor for the last 10 years competing in bikini and then just did my first figure show three weeks ago, which I won my class. After competing uh, MAPS Anabolic, you guys got me hooked on getting stronger. So I'm taking a step away from competing and want to concentrate on how strong I can get. I know how important it is to get enough calories in to gain strength. I'm on a whole food carnivore diet, mainly eating high quality meats like grass fed beef, bison, salmon, free range eggs, chicken, and seafood. I'm consuming, uh, consuming around 1500 calories a day because I just can't eat anymore. And I know it's going to eventually affect my strength gains. I know I can get more calories in if I eat grain fed beef, as it's higher in fat. My question is, is 1500 high quality calories just as good as eating 2000 lower quality calories when trying to bulk for strength, muscle and size? Does calorie quality make much of a difference? Good question. And context yeah. really yes. matters here. Yeah. So, <clears throat> okay. So if you consumed another 500 calories, uh, but it came from Gummy more <laughs> more saturated fat or whatever. I mean, it would depend on the balance of what else you're eating, but you you, you need more calories yeah. for someone who trains as much as you do. Um, so let me ask you this, because I know we talked last. Time, I remember our conversation. Are you okay with consuming honey or fruit, or do you re, do you react to anything that's not uh, you know strictly in the carnivore list? Can you have any kind of carbohydrate? Uh, yes, I do well with melons and oranges, and yes, honey and maple syrup. Okay. I would, I would add, car, so I would, that's what I would add. I would yeah. add a, a, a few servings of those kinds of things because your protein's probably fine. Your fat is probably fine. Where you'll get the strength gains are going to be from some of that glycogen. Mm -hmm. That's where you're going to get some of those strength gains. So if, if so, if, so rather than switching to grain fed, I would add uh, honey, melon, oranges, and get some of those carbohydrates in there. And you'll you'll get pumps, you'll get stronger, you'll see some pretty pretty good results from yeah, that. Yeah, how are, what about berries and stuff? Are you able to do berries? Yeah, I can do berries. Yeah, I would. I just I would start to add fruit. I'd That's add it. Fruit and honey to the diet. That's it. And uh, I I think you would see a, a, a big bump in calories and energy. Yep. Uh, from that fifteen hundred, uh, even if they're pure, clean, great, those are great calories, and that's a. Uh, maybe a, a good calorie mark to stay lean and ripped and fit uh, as far as aesthetically. But if you're going to build muscle and you're going to get strong, we're, I'm going to need you over 1,500 calories at some point. Yeah. Especially someone like you, you have a good amount of lean body mass. You, you've been training for a long time. Uh, you've done exceptionally well considering the calories are so low. Um, so, uh, you know, and at this point, like adding some of those carbohydrates, you're just going to see – more gains from it because again, your protein and your fat is great. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm assuming you you're, you're hitting your body weight in more in protein because of the food choices. 
So I, I wouldn't be worried about that. I would I would add the the honey, the melon, the berries, the uh, you know ways of getting some of those carbohydrates in, which you're gonna and you look at all the look, try it out, but you look at all the data on carbohydrates and they contribute significantly to to power output in particular. Can you have uh, peanut butter, oatmeal, probably not, and honey? Mm. You said honey already. Honey, Can you have yeah. peanut? No, no, those are both pretty yeah. reactive. Okay. I was curious. Mm. But yeah, I've been doing really good. Um, like my strength has been increasing since I started MAPS Anabolic. My strength has doubled. Wow. Hey. Really? That's and awesome. That's amazing. I'm so excited and just hooked on just getting stronger and stronger. And that's why I'm putting the bikini away and mm -hmm. just want to get as strong as I can. Isn't it fun? Yeah. yeah. It's so much fun. So thank you so much for that. How would you compare uh, your lifting before to anabolic? So is anabolic, does it feel like, wow, it's so much less than you what you're used to and you're getting stronger? Is it the same amount of volume? What does it feel like in comparison to what you do, did before? Uh, well, before I was just overtraining and just doing higher reps. Yeah. And now I'm taking more rest days and taking more rest in between sets. And yeah, it's crazy. Like, for instance, I was only squatting 50 pounds before. Now I'm at 175 yeah. in the matter of three. <laughs> wow. That's so sick. Yeah. That's, 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 that, that's awesome. But you, you know, what's cool about this too, Christina, is you probably notice just a quality of life improvement because right. you probably have more energy, better sleep, the whole deal. Better mood, all that stuff. More time. <laughs> yeah. Big time. Yeah. Well, no. awesome. Well, good job. Great. I'm glad to hear this, but yeah, add those carbs from food <clears throat> sources that you don't react to. Cause I'm assuming you went, and I think we had this, if I'm trying to recall, you went carnivore because you just reacted terribly to certain foods. Yeah. So I would yeah, bad auto. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So reintroduce those carbs and do it slow. Do it slowly. Bump them up. And what you should notice pretty quickly is strength gains. Like yeah. you should notice within a couple days that you're just feeling stronger in the gym. And yep. should I take that before I out or after? Before. Before. before but to power your work. Yeah. yeah. After two, potentially. But I mean, I would love to see, like, I would love to see a, uh, yeah, see if you can show a fruit, a fruit bowl with like honey drizzled all over it before you go into a workout. Yeah. Like, like if that, you, let's say you're eating, uh, you know, a hundred grams of carbs. Okay. I would do, uh, like 50 before, maybe two hours before, an hour before, 50 afterwards. Like surround your workout with the carbohydrates if they're that low. If they start to get higher than that, then you can have them throughout the day. Um, but uh, it would be around the workout, you know, an hour and a half or two before and then post-workout. Okay, awesome. And can I do a shout out? Yeah. Sure. So I, um, I took a course um, through Logan Dube from PPSE. It's to become a pain-free performance specialist because I want to go more into the training. And she just put on a really good course about mobility and just how to exercise pain-free. So I just wanted to do a shout out to her. Awesome. Nice. Congrats. Christina, are you attending our webinars for trainers and coaches? I, I had an air horn. Um, I'm going to start. I've been getting the emails. I want to. Yeah. Awesome. All right, cool. I hope to see you there. Awesome. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. Yeah. You got it. Okay. She said double her strength, but that sounds like that more, 50 to yeah, 170. I was say it's a bit more than double. Yeah. Holy Toledo. I mean, I would love to see what happens when she actually hits some hit some good calorie numbers with some carbs before. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. she's gonna carbs she's, for work. Do you remember do you remember she could have Greek yogurt? I can't remember. No. Cause like a, like she's a, reactive yeah. to so many different things and the most reactive foods tend to be grains, dairy. Uh, well, legumes. That's why she went all the way down to carbs. Legumes yeah. and yeah, dairy. Yeah. So that's why so So a big fruit bowl with honey all over it yeah. would be an awesome yeah. pre workout. Oh. Yeah and you're seeing yeah. a lot of carnivore Huge people elevation. do this. Yeah, they yeah. go carnivore for a long time and then it's just like okay let me see if I can add some Honey, that's usually where they start. And then maybe add some fruit. Mm -hmm. And then they just feel so much better. Yeah. It's early access to Black Friday. All MAPS programs. All bundles. 60% off. Also, if you get a bundle, you'll get 10 entries to win. If you buy a program, you'll get five entries to win. Everything else, one entry to win. Five days at the Mind Pump House in Park City. It's got a gym. It's got a cold dip. It's got a sauna. It's got red light therapy. It's all kinds of great stuff. Five-day vacation hooked up with $1,000 for travel accommodations as well. Early access, Black Friday. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code Black Friday for the 60% off and the entries to win uh, a vacation at the Mind Pump Park City House. All right, back to the show. Our next caller is Drew from the UK. Drew, what's happening? How you doing, Drew? Hey, guys. How you doing? Nice to meet you. You too. Nice to meet yeah. you, man. How can we help you? 
Okay, um, don't know everyone comes and says, hey guys, great fans, big day, nice to meet you. But um, yeah, I've uh, I've discovered you guys during lockdown, so I had a, a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> um, and the content you play is obviously really, really positive. But I don't I don't think it gets recognised enough that the effect that the the, the content that you play will probably have on people's mental health as well. It's been a massive help, so I want to say thank you for that. Oh, appreciate thank that. Thank you, Drew. All right, so I know everyone always starts as well, a little bit of a backstory, but mine, uh, mine only really goes back, back to the, the start of the year um, when I started taking my training a little bit seriously. Okay. Um, I was going to the gym previously, but not really taking anything outside the gym, really paying any attention to it. So I decided to get serious about that. Um, made sure... I could pick a routine and times of day that I could be consistent with because I'd skip them if I uh, skip them or cut routines short if I didn't have enough time. Um, made sure my protein was on point, the, the my, my my macros and my calorie intake was good. Um, I wanted to, as most guys do, I wanted to lose weight, uh, lose some body fat, but maintain the muscle mass that I had, and it worked far better than I expected it to. Uh, then after a few months, um, obviously I started to plateau and thought I'd go into a bulk. Um, I couldn't stay, I couldn't stay eating and going and staying on a deficit for too long. Um, so I tweaked a couple of things that you would normally do when you go into a bulk. So I dropped the cardio, focus more resistance, increase my macros and increase my protein intake. Um, and it's had, it's had no effect. Well, that's, that's not entirely true. Had uh, an effect I didn't really expect. So my body fat went up, went up, which I would, ex- which I thought it would, and my weight did. But I feel like my strength gains has actually decreased since I've tried to go on a bulk. Hmm. Okay. Uh, 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 Programming yep. and also like maybe what foods are we doing and if you have any gut stuff going on. How, like how much of digestion. a bu- how much of a bulk did you go on? How many extra calories? Okay, so uh, when I was in my um, deficit, I was on uh, uh, 200 under maintenance. When I went on my bulk, I went to 200 over. Oh, that's it? Okay. Um, it's a programming yeah, issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a programming yeah. issue, Drew. Um, we got to yeah, switch your workout. Mm-hmm. We, we got to change your workout yeah, so up. I, Were you doing the same style of workout the whole time? Yes, yeah, so I went um, – because uh, I've, I've tried to – I've run through um, um, anabolic a few times, but I, re- I really struggled to fit – Full full body in on a single day, so I went to push pull legs and cardio twice a week, and that's what really really was very very effective. When I uh, I went I went from uh, one sixty five pounds down to one fifty two, and went from twenty one percent body fat down to fifteen. Um, so I uh, I went from ten to twelve reps, and when I went onto the bulk, I dropped down to five to eight reps. Um. I uh, dropped the cardio and just focused on the resistance. But I felt that from from when I first started the bulk to to now, um, and I was doing three and I was doing three sets. Now I actually have to strip some weight off during the last set because I can't manage what I was managing before. It's the, it's, 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 it's the first time that I, I never really could. I, I thought I'd, I'd tweaked all the things that I needed to. It was the first time I had come into consideration of fact of my age because I'm 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 43. I know uh, your, your testosterone starts to go down a little bit as you get older. Um, is does it become that much more difficult as you get older to 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 put on muscle and is it easier to lose body fat? A little bit, could but that be, could that, some, that, there's, that, there's something else going. Yeah, there's, there's something else going. It wouldn't be that. Here. It wouldn't happen that quickly though. Yeah. What you tend to see as you age, especially for consistent is a slow, gradual change. It doesn't yeah. happen from one phase to another. So it's either the workout programming, you need to back off on some volume, or there's something else, yeah. this other factor, Hot sleep, sleep or stress. stress. Yeah. How are we 100%. testing this body fat too, by the way? Uh, you're not going to like this. Okay. <laughs> I've got a, um, a, a body composition scale. Okay. Are no, you- that's uh, I, 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 I know they're not, I know they're not accurate, but basically, I was I was focusing mainly on how my clothes fit and how much weight I was shifting at the gym. Sure, sure. Yeah. And I now um, I, 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 I don't want to have to replace all my wardrobe because all of my clothes are now far too big. <laughs> I've got I've dropped I've dropped four inches off my waist since I since I started the cut, um, and the weight continuously um, increased. Hmm. Um, while I was uh, while I was on my cut, but um, I haven't been able to put 
any I've been I've been on the book now for about a month and a half and I haven't been able to put any weight on the bar at all. Hmm. Typically that's a programming issue. Yeah. If all the other factors sounds like stress are the same and, and then stress and sleep are the same as they were before. Um yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not. They're, yeah, they're not. They're not too different. I've. Um, I've. Uh, I, I usually. Uh, I usually try and go to the gym now before work rather than after, so I'm not too tired. So my my, my sleep my sleep patterns all the same. Um, there's there's things that uh, and work and, and home with and 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 a few, and a few things that have, have elevated stress a bit, but not um not anything that I would really consider that I've noticed that much. Hmm. Okay, and when you say a little bit, are you somebody that like you, you don't you don't really address stress? Sometimes people say it's a little bit. I'm like, what's going on? And they're like, well, you know, I'm getting divorced. Oh, that's a big yeah. stress. You know, are you, so is it, is it, is it really a little bit of stress or is it, or is it something like if the average person would be like, Hey mate, you're going through something. Yeah, I think you. <laughs> no, no, it's no, it's no, it's nothing. Um, no, no, it's, uh, it's nothing. Uh, it's no, it's nothing, it's nothing major like that. It's just, it's just a, it's a remortgage on the house and trying to get all the paperwork and everything sorted on time and just letters and emails backwards and forwards. But okay. Other other than that, really, nothing nothing else has changed. My my my, my, my son is is now uh, he's, he's nine, going on fourteen, so uh, he's becoming more and more of a handful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah let's let's switch up your programming. Yeah. Um, I'd like to see you. Team that's fifteen. There you go. How long have you been working out consistently now? Uh, uh, cons uh, consistently, like not not ignoring the fact that I was. Um, uh, that I that I wasn't paying attention to diet and anything before that. It's so about three years that I've been going to the gym, but I only really made a, a conscious effort that you know what, I'm putting in all this work and I'm not seeing any results. I've tried so many different things. I, I went through I went, I went through anabolic and, and I, I enjoyed it, but it was difficult with the time constraints. It was like, well, there's got to be something else. So as soon as I changed my diet that's when everything suddenly kind of clicked and everything started working and everything that I, all the goals that I was aiming for they all work, so they all come into place, but it's only since I tweaked it and changed to go into a bulk that it kind of hasn't. Yeah, yeah. it's almost, if everything's the same, then it's got to be the programming. That's Matt, what I'm going to do. I'd love to see you run Mass 15, Drew. Do the advanced version, mm -hmm. yeah. and then and let's, and let's see what happens. We're going to send it over to you, and I'd like to I'd like to... I'd like to hear back from you in about uh, give me thirty sixty days. You should see if if it's if it is a programming issue. What you should notice with Maps fifteen, do the barbell and dumbbell version, is you should notice your strength go up within the first week or two. It's going to feel way different too, by the way, because it's a lot. The volume is way less in that. So mm -hmm. don't don't add anything. Don't do any like just just follow the programming, trust the process, and then circle back with us in like thirty days and talk to us what you're noticing. Okay, that sounds good. I appreciate it. All right, Drew, you, you got yeah. it, man. Awesome. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate Thank your you. time. Alrighty. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. See you. Yeah, stuff like that's mm. almost always a programming issue if what they're saying is accurate. Yeah, if there's not other things that, yeah, we haven't investigated. Yes, because sometimes, like I and it may be, you know, I, I believe them, right? I always believe the person of what course. they tell you. But, right, you know, right. I, I've worked with people before, um, and it's like we're trying to figure things out, you know, four months into it. I'm like you thought. I thought you said your sleep yeah, was good. Yeah, but I mean, we're all a little bit <laughs> blind to our own patterns. That's right. You know, so you got to consider that. There's, there's also what happens is when you train, uh, and you're hitting uh, a, a beyond what's appropriate volume, and you're getting away with it for a while. Yeah. You don't get away with it forever. Yeah, and so yeah. what tends to happen is you get this cumulative effect of volume. And then suddenly you stop progressing and you start to go backwards. And you think to yourself, what happened? Nothing changed. Nothing mm -hmm. changed. In fact, I'm eating more. I should be gaining more. Well, you, you were you were probably overdoing it a little bit before, and now you've been overdoing it for so long yeah. Yeah. that it catches it's, up with you, which is why we went to, for people wondering, that's why we went to Mass 15. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you we talked about this, I think, off air about the the whole series that I'm doing right now. Like, I could have seen a bunch of muscle gain and still seen positive things, doing stuff, a lot of things the wrong way. Yeah. So your body is pretty resilient, and if you're somebody who's never really dialed your diet in, and even if, even if you have a subpar programming, and then all of a sudden you you dial a diet in, and yep. all of a sudden you you start seeing results, um, sometimes it's it's in spite of what you're doing. It's just like that your body needed that alone, and then that made a big difference. It's like we can still improve that. There's also the potential, and I didn't want to go down this rabbit hole because who knows, um, but those those scales that have the body fat percentage thing. Are so inconsistent, uh, and if yeah, he, he had carbs at the time, well, yeah. So if he had a let's say, if, and you're on a bulk, right? So and and 
if he's a guy who has a hard time bulking and he has to really push the calories and let's say the night before and or the morning, I don't even know what he did. Like if he loaded up on carbohydrates the night before he went to bed and then the next day he goes and does that body fat thing, that thing can be skewed quite a bit. Yeah. So uh, there could be that also. The thing that yeah. was probably most concerning the is strength the loss. strength, the strength that's, loss. Yeah, like that's that, doesn't, that doesn't add up. It's like, okay, that's weird that you're having to take weight off the bar that it sounds like you are moving more of. And so programming stress and then a digestion would be the other thing would be yeah, to dive, right. dive into that. It's like, is he, is he now on his bulk? Is he adding something that is just not agreeing with Did his he system? Did he test his hormones? I didn't no. catch that. No, okay. he was just asking about it. And, and yes, you, your hormones have an effect, but it won't, it, it wouldn't be that drastic. It's not, that it wouldn't be a big No, it's not like, like, Oh my God, yeah. I went from this part. And then all of a sudden Still. it's more of a gradual effect. Our next caller is Zach from Maryland. What's up, Zach? How can we help you? What's happening? Hey, guys. How's it going? Good, Good. man. So uh, it's, a, it's a little more nerve-wracking than I thought uh, coming on the show, even though uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've been following you guys for a while. That's right. Um, We're just so pretty much just jump into my question. I've been following Adam's journey lately with, the, uh, with his rebuild that he's going through. And um, you restructured max 15 to work around an injury and my question is not so much an in, an injury but how would i restructure maps 15 to be more of like a like a maps like 35 or 45 uh like a mix of 15 and anabolic if i want to add some volume in on like days that i can try train a little longer i like that i think mm -hmm. that it's actually pretty easy considering that the program is is yeah. relatively low volume so you could kind of go what i would do so doug and i were kind of talking off air a while back and he's like hey if i was following your kind of journey but i wanted to put emphasis on shoulders what would i do and i said oh, i just add some shoulder volume into this program so what I would do if I was you and you wanted uh, to add a little bit to it is I would pick one or two muscle groups that you want to bring up, you know, or that you want to focus on. So it could be shoulders, it could be calves, it could be four, it could be anything you want. And I would build in a, on those days that you have 30, 45 minutes, probably one or two more exercises on just those specific days. And you should be fine because the volume is low enough on there. What I wouldn't do is add a like a I wouldn't add a bunch of uh, big compound lifts in there, but you could easily add some isolation type exercises. So I wouldn't add a bunch of uh, more squats, more deadlifts. Like we the the program is comprised of some of the big big motor movements. The idea that it was a minimalist program. What's the the least amount of exercise you could do to get the biggest bang for your buck? That's how we created that. Now, if I was going to go and say, hey, I have days where I could go thirty minutes. And I want to do some other things. Well, those other things would be other little mo uh, muscles that I'd want to focus on. So whether that be shoulders, abs, calves, whatever. And I'd add one to two exercises on those days that I have more time. The, the real question, Zach, is is why do you want to add more volume? I feel like I'm not seeing the results. And I don't know if it's um, calories are too low or, you know, just intensity is a little low or what. Usually I'm working out and I have a seven-year-old and a three-year-old with me kind of hanging out. So my rest times aren't just like kind of resting. I'm kind of playing cars or helping with gymnastics or that's great. <laughs> so that sure. kind of stuff. So the real, so the real, uh, we, we want to know if maybe my intensity is low. Well, I was going to say, we, we want to figure out why, uh, why that's happening. It's often not because you're not doing enough volume. I'm not saying that that's not the case sometimes. Sometimes that is the case. But often the answer isn't to add more volume. Uh, often it has to do more with diet if the intensity is appropriate. So let's go to diet real quick. Okay. Do you know what your calories at, your grams of protein? Are you consistent with all that? Yeah. Yeah, so my, my protein's between about 180 to 200. Um, pretty much, I mean, spot on seven days. Um, and then my calories are sitting right around like 27 to 2,800. And, and what is your goal? Is it to, to gain? Are you in a gain phase? Yeah, I'm trying to, trying to gain now and then, you know, springtime cut down. But so I've been at 27 to 2,800 for about, I guess it's been about six weeks now. And 
I'm, I don't know uh, if you're familiar with uh, the Carbon app from yes. Lane. Yeah. Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what I use. I use his AI on there, and it's pretty good. Man, if you're if you're like not spot on with like the, your scale weight, it will not bump your calories. Even though like I I feel like I could eat more, it won't. That will not. So I, part of me is kind of like, do I just kind of go on my own? And and not use the AI model or so you feel like you could eat more and you technically almost want want to eat more, but the app's telling you to stay at this calorie point. Yeah, there's certain times, certain times, okay, uh, where, I, where I could eat could eat some more. Okay, well, and you're watching my series, right? So one of the things, and I'm so I'm yeah. sure you've heard me communicate this too, because there's two things that could be put potentially happening. I mean, you could be in a very sweet spot, which I know the way Lane has designed that app is it's designed to to really, really slowly increase you and really try and shoot for that kind of Goldilocks zone, right? Try and get to but only barely bump your calories when you need to. And if you're doing a really good job of hitting your caloric maintenance, you should lean a little bit. You should also build yep. muscle. Yep. Um, you might be doing better than what you think you are. Uh, just because you don't see any major shifts in the scale, you could be slowly changing body comp which uh, you know, you've heard me communicate while I've been going through my journey right now. And I know what a mental fuck that can be because you don't see the scale yeah. move that much. You see yourself every day in the mirror. It's like, am I really moving? Am I doing any better? Um, if you're hitting yeah, exactly. It, I mean, you could potentially I don't see the I don't see the I don't see the change. And I know it's a slow process, but I, I don't see the change like I like my brain tells me that I want to see the change. Yeah. yeah. Are, is your strength any different? Yeah. How are your lifts? Uh, lifts are, lifts are going up. Oh, bro, um, you're doing good. Zach, you're fine. You're doing, you're doing good, Zach. If you're getting stronger, you're, you're doing good. If you're getting stronger, you're doing good. Yeah. And, 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 and don't add volume. And, That's and, why I was asking. And Sal, and Sal, Sal challenging. I mean, I was just purely thinking like out of like, Oh, I'd like to do more stuff. Uh, but if it's because you didn't think you were seeing good results, uh, adding volume isn't necessarily the answer, no. especially considering you're getting strong. Sounds like you're kind of way to staying the same. You know, you're hitting your protein take. You're following a good app like Lane's carbon app. Uh, I I would actually guess you're probably right in that little sweet spot, which is a is a mind fuck, bro. It's why most people can't yeah. most people can't do it. It messes with their head. I, I, it's it's really hard, and I've <laughs> I've kind of been the the type I hear you guys talk about the yo yo dieting, and I've kind of, I've the past in the past I've I've kind of done that up and down, up and down, and you know became that little bit softer version of of what I was, softer, mm. smaller version, but never really in in the uh uh like body fat range that i want to be at yeah. so so for me to not see change and continue to eat more is really hard yeah, right? I, I get it no stay the course i get it i get it if what, you're getting stronger uh you're you're, you're improving yeah. what, what's your stay the course what's your height and weight too zach metric. where you at what, how, how, how tall and big are you height I, I'm, I'm about i'm five nine about 191 192 okay those are good calories and you're, you're you're moving up just fine i yeah i actually think that they probably have you right where you're supposed to be bro really really good i mean here's the thing too okay if you're a client of mine and you were really struggling with this it doesn't i can put you on a 200 calorie bump for a week you're not gonna get fat from that you know but if you wanted to feel it and you wanted to see does it make this yeah. improvement or you see this visual improvement there's another thing that happens when you're right on the sweet spot of calories like and and let me tell you like I'm always reminded of this as I go through this process. So uh, I don't know if you how closely you're following or not, but just last week was the end of my bulk, and I and I I hit two peak days of four thousand plus calories. I hadn't this whole time I haven't seen over four thousand calories. And bro, let me tell you, I felt good. I looked good. I'm all filled out. But I know that I, I'm. That's because I'm all filled up. It's not because I've necessarily got more muscle, just because I've filled up all those muscle bellies. And so in the reflection, are good. But if I kept holding those calories that high, I'd put on body fat. Did I lose him, Doug? Yeah, he just disappeared. That's all right. He didn't like my answer. No. <laughs> uh, oh, he's coming, he's coming back. Okay. Oh, he's back. Uh, there we are. Oh, hey. I thought you didn't, oh, there we are. I thought you didn't like oh, my God. answer. <laughs> I thought you didn't like my answer. <laughs> You're like, yeah. fuck this guy. No, no. I didn't, <laughs> Whatever, I didn't hear it. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> So I don't know where, I don't know if you heard me saying that, uh, you know, I had these back to back to back days of 
real high calorie, 4,000 calorie. And all of a sudden my body, I saw it for the first time, like, oh man, now I feel really good. But I know I can't keep those calories that high because it'll eventually continue to overspill and get stored as body fat. So then I come back down to like today, 3,000 calories. And now I feel like I lost eight pounds of muscle, but I didn't lose eight pounds of muscle. It's just that my muscle bellies aren't filled up. So it's the psychological okay. game of like, if you're hovering right around that good maintenance calories, you're going to have moments when the body's filled up, it looks kind of good. Then you have times when, in the bodybuilding world, we call this flat. You're just not, you're not, you're not really filling the muscle bellies up. You're kind of keeping in this maintenance low level. And sometimes in a deficit, that's going to lean you out, lose body fat. Sometimes you're going to be building. That's that Goldilocks zone. Problem with the Goldilocks zone is psychologically, it's a mind fuck because you feel like, man, yeah. I just don't look like I'm putting any muscle and size on. But you know, if you want to mess with this just for shits and giggles, run two days in a row of eating like 3,500 calories, just two days in a row, 3,500 calories, and tell me what you look and feel like. But don't get stuck there because you probably don't need to be that high. But two big days of 3,500 right. calories, watch how your body fills out. And But what you need to know is all I'm teaching you is that's just what your body looks like when we fill all those muscle bellies up. And then you can kind of see for a second, oh, shit, maybe I have put on size. I just haven't filled these muscle bellies all the way out. All the way up. Okay. Yes. And then go back to your carb right. guy or your carb carbon app and follow because i'm the, the the technology in that and what lane's doing is good work there yeah yeah i like i like it it's it's i like the i like the uh structure of it it's it's pretty good are you are you on instagram um, do you follow me on instagram yeah yeah, yeah. Do, uh yeah dude do, do, i actually i'm uh i was in i was talk. i mentioned mentioned my uh chevelle when uh, uh you were on one of your lives uh, uh okay yeah, yeah yeah okay yeah yeah so uh Hit me, do two days of like thirty five hundred calories, and hit me up in the DMs, and and we can chat. I bet I bet you you, you feel and notice a difference from pictures? that. Yeah, <laughs> it's stupid. Okay, don't get jealous, bro. <laughs> you, <laughs> you guys got a second for another? Yeah, yeah, fire away, like bro. Follow up. What you got? What you got? So if uh, so let's say I I because with having little kids, you guys all know uh, I'm probably gonna be maps fifteen or you know hovering around there for a while. Um. Could I change it up to be more of like a symmetry, like where I just change all the barbell stuff out for unilateral yep. type work? You, 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 you know, that, that you, way my joints don't, don't start talking to me. You can. You could also hang tight for about mm -hmm. how many weeks, Justin? <laughs> yeah, two De weeks. December. So December? Is it December? The 11th. Oh, December 11th. So December 11th, we'll have something specifically for you. <laughs> yes. Okay. If you can wait that. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. yeah, if not. So if, if you can hang into Mass 15 till then, we got something coming December 11th that will we'll be speak. perfect. It'll speak your, right honestly. to what you're talking about right now. All right. Awesome. Okay. Sounds good. All, all right, right, man. All right, Zach. Cool. All right. Thanks. Thanks for all your help, guys. I'll talk you to you later. I, you know, uh, if someone's not progressing with their workouts, uh, I would say, and they're consistent. Okay. So they're already consistent. 80% of the time, the answer is not to add more. Yeah, volume. I'm glad you did that because yeah. I just went straight for. I mean, this is how you would add volume. That's what yeah. your answer. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. But but eighty percent of the time, that's not the answer. Yeah, it, it I should have time, asked why though. Why yeah. do you want it? Why exactly. do you want to do that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you know, most of the time, it's not that. It's something else. Um, and again, there's twenty percent of the time when adding volume is what you need to do. But that's often not the case. And the reason why I asked that is if his answer was. I just like working out and I want to do more. I was like, okay, here you go. That's yeah. what you can do, you know, because that's me, right? I add volume, not because it's appropriate oftentimes because I want to spend more time <laughs> in the gym. It's fun and yeah, you're you're challenging yourself. That's it, 100%. Yeah, but he's but the fact that he is seeing strength gains. He's doing great. His yeah. body's not moving much. He's he's falling an app. He's like getting car, leaner and building muscle. Yes, he's like in that. And, and it's, it is wild uh, th how this works, you know? And it, I'm telling you, it's... It, it doesn't matter how many times I've done this. It's even a mind fuck for me. So I yeah. know these people, how they have a and hard you, time. And you, and you're, ex you're experienced. Yes. You know, yeah, exactly. Yes. And you know what's happening. And when you, and, but when you're in that Goldilocks zone, you're always tipping in and out of surplus deficit, surplus deficit. That's what the Goldilocks zone is. You're never, the Goldilocks zone isn't this like special calorie where you're, you're building muscle and burning body at the same time. What it means is that you're staying so close to what maintenance is that sometimes you tip over into anabolic and surplus. Yep. Sometimes you tip over into catabolic and a deficit. That's right. Now here's the problem with that is that when you do that, when you, when you push calories hard, this is why bodybuilders still do it this way because they psychologically like to see the scale. They want to see the scale. They want to see their muscle bellies filled out. And psychologically, 
it's easier for me to run at 4,500 calories, which is way more than I need because I'm in a bulk right now and I see myself filled out and yeah. bulked up and I'm like, yeah, I'm doing the right thing. Versus if I was probably where I need to be, which is more like 38, 3,900 calories, and I never, I never get to see me all the way filled out. And I'm again, I, I, I just did this two days in a row, 4,000 plus calories. And boy, I, I was like, oh, there I am. Like, mm -hmm. there it is. There. But then I go right back in a day later and I drop down to 3,000 calories. Right. All of a sudden, it look, I look like I lost 10 pounds of muscle. It's That's like, right. I know I didn't lose 10 pounds of muscle. I'm just, I'm just deflated in comparison. All right, I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out. 30% body fat. For men, this is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible, but not if you guess along the way. So we're gonna talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now there's a huge range, right, of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher body.